democracy. We take it for granted, it exists out there, yet it is changing. It is so important, it enables us to be here, for example, to do what we do, to have civil rights, but it is under threat. The good news is that if we get some error, there are things that you guys, me and you, all together, there's something we can do. Let's start having a look at how we changed over the years. So this would have been your family if you were born, let's say, 70, 80 years ago. Things have gone a long way. There you see the father sitting in his armchair holding something that probably you don't even remember exists, a paper newspaper. And the kids are gathering, and are quite exciting, are gathering around um, this odd piece of furniture that is a radio. The radio was back then pretty big to start with, but also pretty magical. So people would gather around it. It would become the center of life in the living room. This is your family today. Many people, many devices. You've got flat screens, smartphones, tablets, remote controls, laptop. We do most of it through the internet. We listen to music, we watch TV, we watch movies, we shop, and we also speak to family and friends, especially when they're far away. And this is your family in a few years, not even that many, in the smart home of the near future. A lot of it is really already here. What happens? We're through the Internet of Things, a number of objects of um, you know, common use, like fridges, of cars, are going to be connected to the grid. And they're going to, in a way or another, outsmart us. The car is going to be able to book its own maintenance appointment. The tennis racket is going to comment on your performance. The fridge is going to remind you when the milk is about to get off. And, the most creepy of all, the bike is going to tell your parents when you said you were going to school, but in fact, in a sunny day in June, you have taken a detour to the park. Now, all of this is possible because of three interconnected phenomena, which have and continue to have dramatic consequences. The first is called digitization. Not that long ago, so late 50s, the 60s, it all started. So the digitization is the process of turning or creating, if you want, digital versions or analog and physical objects. For example, photos, but also text, and much more. It's a process of turning a number of things digital. The excitement around it was so big, its consequences so dramatic, that it has been termed the third industrial revolution. The first, you might remember, was the combustion engine, the second, electricity. Imagine your life without any of this. Well, the internet as the new technology has had a pretty similar effect on our life. It is called a revolution precisely because everything changes. It's a breakthrough. Nothing is going to be the same again. Connecting to this, there is something which is somewhat more recent, which is called datification. Datification has been termed, has been defined as the ability to render into data aspects of the world of social life that have never been quantified before. Think, for example, about feelings. When you interact with your friends, on social media platforms, you express your feelings with a click, with an emoticon, and that uh, basically makes your feelings quantifiable, but also monetizable. Monetizable because someone, although we get the services for free, we become the product and someone is making sense and making value out of our interactions, including in this, in this example, also of our feelings. And then there's the third uh, very dr important dramatic change. And again, we are already living through that. The age of machine learning and artificial intelligence. 
you've just seen some robots. You've already heard a lot about that uh, this morning. What is it? Well, it, is, it has been termed the fourth industrial revolution. Why the fourth? Well, because again, it's something that changes everything. But contrary to the other three, this is not about a really dramatically new technology. These are so, sort of incremental changes. What the fourth industrial revolution is about is the fusion of technologies that make them so powerful, the internet and much more. Machine learning is the ability of computers to self-educate, to learn from their own um, sort of the instruction that they've received at the beginning in ways that are also, uh, you know, turn out to be, to have unexpected consequences. Um, if you look at, you know, the original uh, planning sometimes. The, the fourth industrial revolution blurs the lines between the physical, the biological, and the digital. Again, in ways that we have only just started to chart. What does this mean? Well, the ecosystem is changing. The ecosystem as we used to imagine it. And this is the ecosystem as it is today. This is just one of the many representations that you can imagine. Hyper digital, hyper connected. But what does this mean for the system we live in, for the political system we live in and that allows us to have a beautiful life we have at least here in the Netherlands? What happens to democracy? Well, to start with, I mean, there's a lot of excitement about all these possibilities. I and mean, I'm not here to tell you to get depressed. On the contrary. Thumbs up to the, all the possibilities that technologies open up for us. Connection uh, with friends uh, and families, the ability to travel very far from, uh, you know, the comfort or, or your sofa uh, to shop and get to know a number of things. Socially, we are definitely much more empowered than before. Our voice can be heard. When I was a child, I wanted to become a journalist because I wanted my voice to be heard. Now, you can be your own journalist if you want. You can be your own storyteller. So all of this is very exciting and very beautiful and definitely represents exciting new ways of participating in democracy as citizens. We not only vote every four or five years, you're gonna soon be voting, I assume, perhaps some of you already has. Well, in the past, that was the only way you had to talk to your representative in parliament, for example. You could also go through the news, but good luck with that. Now, we have apps that allow us to directly talk to our member of parliament. We have apps like Fix My Street that help um, students report the, the problems in, in their uh, you know, daily school infrastructure so that everything can be improved. We have a similar app which is called Fix My Street where you can report uh, the broken lamp or the pothole in the street so that no one is gonna you know, crash uh, on his body next time. So all of this is very good. But sadly, there is also something to worry about. Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden uh, is a former contractor, a very smart guy, working, at least he was working back then, for the National Science Foundation, uh, <laughs> uh, for the National Security Agency of the United States. So those people that overlook the security of citizens in a country. There is one such agency in every democratic country and beyond. So he had access to a number of informations and uh, he realized that his own country, the United States of America, was spying on its own people. Not only on its own people, but was spying extensively on foreign citizens willing to come, for example, in, uh, in, uh, into the United States. What he did, starting in 2013 and still doing it, is starting releasing a number of classified documents, secret information, that reveal all this blanket monitoring and mass surveillance practices by the United States and by many others, including our beautiful Netherlands. Now, a lot of this has to do with national security. So we ought to be very grateful that this agencies exist and, and the prevent for, to prevent, for example, terrorism and terrorist attacks. But we also live in a democracy, so we also have to hold our 
controllers accountable for what they do to, for example, our civic rights. And what Edward Snowden did was to remind us that privacy is actually the funda fundament of democracy. It's a very important value that we often take for granted, but we should actually pay attention to and protect. Yes, we are being watched. We are being watched through the credit card that we used, through the OV chip card that you use to travel across the country. We are being watched through our smartphone, which is actually the smartest, literally, a surveillance device ever in invented, which even surveils us when it is on a flight mode. So what do we do? We like to use it. We like to use the OV chip card. All of this makes our life beautiful and easy, and we want more of that. But it gets a little more creepy when not only we are surveilled, but when, for example, this data that people gather around about us, states and corporations, are actually used to shape our behavior. So to change what you're gonna do next. You might remember Cambridge Analytica, it was a scandal earlier this year when it became clear that Facebook, the platform that many of us uh, still use, um, had, so had been exploited by Cambridge Analytica, and actually pretty willingly, uh, who, uh, so Cambridge Analytica gathered 87 million profiles and all the data about those profiles. 87 million Facebook users and used this data to target uh, advertising and political advertising in, in particular in a way that would, able, that would be able to change your voting pattern. So you will be fed only certain informations. You will not see the diversity of opinion that exists in the world, but you will be slightly and kindly taken in a certain direction. So this is something to, to worry about as democratic citizens. The social contract between citizens and states has been altered, and has been altered also because of corporations that are trying to uh, leverage these possibilities for causes which are not necessarily transparent or also not necessarily good for uh, you know, democracy. So what really ch is at stake here is the nature of democracy. Our democracy is changing. There's plenty of research that shows that if you know that you are being spied, although most of us have nothing to hide, this has chilling effects on your free speech. So instead of thinking and, and saying something out loud or saying something on social media, you're just gonna keep it to yourself and you understand how dangerous this is. This might be a little remote possibilities, thinking about your life in the Netherlands, we live in a democracy, we have tons of rights here, yet it is something that has been observed in democracies as well. The chilling effect is detrimental to democratic participation. Is it really a system failure? Where is democracy uh, going? Should we worry about it? And yes, the answer is yes. You should be worrying about that. We should be worrying about that. But I'm not here to make you retreat in a little corner with our smartphone. I'm only here to suggest some ways in which you can leverage these processes to become an active citizen, an active participant in the Data5 world. So it's important to think, to start from what we mean with technology. When we think about technology, we think about a tool, right? Can be a microphone like the one that I'm holding, can be a phone, can be a blender to make a smoothie in the morning, can be a coffee machine, a car, you name it. These are things that are, you know, we tend to think of them as neutral. You know, they have a function. If I, I want to use a blender, well, you know, I know how to do it roughly. It's just very practical, it's there, it is a nice service. Actually, if you look at the ancient, uh, the etymology of the world, of the word technology, at the ancient Greek origin of the word techne, it didn't mean instrument. It didn't mean something that you can use and then abandon. It actually m referred to the ability of, the, of humans to make and perform through the tool. So what's really important to remember with technology is that technology is there 
for us to use it in very creative and sometimes subversive, beautiful ways. So stop thinking about the technology that you hold right in your pocket as you know, just a banal instrument. Think at the ways in which you can really put it at your service to make our societies better. So when I was your age, back at the end of the 90s, I was going to reveal my age, we used, and I was an activist wanting to change the world, we used a slogan, which I still find particularly beautiful. Don't hate the media, become the media. So the idea back then is that as an activist wanted to change the world, wanted a better globalization, wanted social justice for all, we realized that really the media wouldn't bother much with you know, spreading our message. So what we did was to sort of ignore mainstream media and just go and create our own. In the same way, I would like to invite you not to hate datification, not to hide from it, not to, you know, spend evenings worrying about what's going to happen to your own civic agency, but to try to leverage uh, all these processes, take them uh, right in uh, your hands, and become a data activist. What is a data activist? A data activist is someone who doesn't take data and technology at face value. A data activist is someone who decides to take a critical attitude towards datification, massive data collection, mass monitoring, and so on. So using what you have right here, your brain, to understand, make sense, and use technology in creative ways for the better. So what I would like to, to do is to show you three simple ways which you can take with you for the summer and that allow you to turn into a powerful data activist. First, learn to program. Programming, guys, is fun. You don't have to be a nerdy nerd. Besides, nerds are actually pretty cool these days. But programming is in the hands of everyone. Back in 2010, a guy, and I'm going to have to quote him because otherwise I don't make him justice, a guy no named Douglas Rushkoff wrote a little book, which to my knowledge wasn't particularly successful, it's a very small thing that you can uh, read for the summer. And what he asks is, do we direct technology or do we get ourselves be directed by it and those who have mastered it? Where do you want to see it? In the control room or amongst those being controlled? What he said, what Douglas said is, choose, choose the former, so choose to direct technology, and you gain access to the control panel of civilization. If you choose uh, the latter, so be controlled, this might well be the last real choice you get to make. So this is a little disempowering if you think about it, but literally it is about learning, understanding, unpacking the technology that we use. There are different degrees of programming that you need uh, to know, but a lot of it is actually as easy as playing a computer game. So don't be shy, don't shy away, decide to program and not be programmed. Then, use encryption. So if we live in a world where everyone is observing us and observing our communication, and you want your communication to stay secure, select apps and devices that are encrypted. If you write an email, encrypt it. What is encryption? Encryption refers to the process, the mathematical process, that allows you to hide the content, muddle the content of a message. Which means that if I write uh, an email to one of you in the audience and I encrypt it, this, the content of the email is only going to be visible to me and to you. And even if my communication is intercepted, and this happens all the time if you use, for example, Gmail, even if the, it gets intercepted, no one can read the content. No, get, no one can see, for example, the naked picture that I send to my boyfriend. Not trivial today. So be smart and encrypt. And this is definitely a task for the summer. Um, you are lucky enough to live in the Netherlands where there is a great digital rights organization, pretty unique in the world, called Bits of Freedom. And Bits of Freedom has a number of volunteers who go around the libraries in this country 
organizing privacy cafes. There you see a little picture. What is a privacy cafe? It's a way of coming together where someone who is slightly more expert than you is going to tell you how to encrypt your communication, how to protect yourself. It is empowering and it is fun. And it doesn't matter that you have nothing to hide. Sooner or later, you're going to be sending that naked pictures and you better be smart about it. And third, use data for good. There's tons of data out there. That's what datification stands for. That's why we keep hearing we live in the age of big data. There's so much information, and so much information can be produced by us. Well, the good news is that this information can be used to harm us, but we can use it to change the world for the better. This picture is from a group called Info Amazonia. So, you know, climate change, deforestation, wild logging, toxic waste, all of this goes on also over there. So the Amazon is the biggest forest in the world and it's also our future as a humankind, yet it is in danger. But, you know, it's such a big area that it's actually difficult to know exactly what is going on. And, you know, very often authorities don't have the will or the capacity to really track it down. Or maybe simply they prefer to hide that they have given away a license to a company to take down uh, and, uh, several million trees for commercial reasons. But often there's corruption involved. Well, the good news is that a group of people, a group of journalists, human rights activists, uh, environmental activists, and data activists are coming together to gather their own data about the Amazon forest. And they use this data to run campaigns, to write reports, to go back to the authorities in their countries and say, hey, something is happening here, you have to stop it. We have the evidence. So they produce their own evidence and use it to change what's going on there. And we all, uh, have all to be very grateful because if the Amazonia survive, survives, we will survive as well as humankind. But there's plenty of examples of how you can use data for the social good. And I'll leave you with this invitation. Open your eyes, there's so many data around you. Think about how you can use it to change the world. And if you're curious about some examples, well, come visit us. Dataactivism.net is my research team at the University of Amsterdam, around the corner from here. We will gladly show you some examples. Thank you very much. <laughs>